<laughs> Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... Not Bunny Williams. Someone else. The non-Bunny Williams. The, the, the... Oh, you mean me. Okay, yes. Yeah. I am Reverend Steve, uh, founder of the Church of Ed Wood, uh, father of three, and um, guy, I guess. Brown-skinned individual. Brown-skinned individual. Yeah, I don't like calling myself Mexican because I'm, I'm I'm more of a Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm not much of a Mexican. I don't speak the language, and I don't I hate Mexican food, so I'm not that great of a Mexican. So you're you're not Danny Trejo. No. I'm not even Mel Gibson, because he did the movie The Mexican, didn't he? Was he, was that him? Or was that... Yeah, I think he was in that movie. Mel Gibson in The Mexican. I don't know if I've seen The Mexican. Well, it was, like, after... Like, in, in, right around when he started going crazy, so that that's understandable as to why you or anyone else in the world didn't see it. I'm pretty sure that's the movie. Yeah, he was really kind of losing me with The Last Temptation of Christ. Although I hear yeah. Apocalypto is actually very good. Yeah, that's what I've heard, but I, haven't, I just can't force myself to sit down and actually consider watching that. Yeah, Meet, Meet the Gringo is always on Netflix, and I just can't, you know. That's what I was thinking of. That's what I was thinking of. That's the movie I was thinking of. No, the Mexican had somebody else in it, like Brad Pitt or somebody. George I, Clooney I, I, or... I have such mixed feelings when it comes to fucking Mel, man. You know, I, you know, when he was good, he could fucking act. You know what I mean? Yeah. Braveheart yeah. was was an enormous movie. Yeah. And I, I I have a hard time holding words against somebody who was drunk. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not too terribly sure because I really didn't follow it very much. I really, I'm not interested in stars very much. He was saying some shit about the Jews or something like that when he was drunk, as far as I understand. And at some point, he called somebody sugar tits. Yeah. You know. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, he really shouldn't have said that. But we all say really stupid ass shit when we're drunk. I don't know. I don't know. I liked Mel Gibson because at some point in time when I was, like, in my early teens, I just realized that, like, I looked at Michael Jackson and I'm like, you are huge, you are you are on the top of the world, but one day I will see, I will live to see you fall. <laughs> one day I will live to see you destroyed, and I just kind of just, Put my hand, rubbed my hands together, and bided my time. And you know yeah. he's on every TV show and on commercials, and he's everywhere. And I'm like, yes, but one day, one day, my friend, <laughs> I will see you fall. And then when I saw him fall, I'm like, ah, yes, okay, yes, let me bathe in this. And then when Britney Spears became huge, I was like, ah, ah, one day, I will live <laughs> to see you fall. Because she was huge and all over the place, and she was making millions. And I thought, ah, but one day, one day, one day she will fall. And I was right about that because she fell huge. And, and then Mel Gibson fell, and I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about you yet. <laughs> Especially after I should have realized that once the Passion of the Christ came out, I'm like, ah, yes, suddenly you are Mr. Jesus, but one day... I didn't expect to see him fall, but I just love it when there's just one big massive celebrity out there and and like I can I can taste the future when it all turns sour, you know? <laughs> and it just feels great, it makes me feel so good about myself. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I can I can live with that. Yeah. You know, I I just I just kinda like Mel. <laughs> you know, and I was yeah. just I'm I'm Dad, he's gone, but I don't totally know if I want him back. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. 
I liked him in Machete too. And you know, I never, I never got around to seeing Machete too, which is a shame because it just, I, I loved the first Machete movie. I loved the movie Grindhouse. Oh, I love Grindhouse, man. And I loved the both of those films. I especially loved the the Quentin Tarantino part of it. I got the DVD, which features, which is just, it, it has so much more to it. It's it's okay. act, it's much longer, and it, it's it's actually more of a regular Quentin Tarantino movie, and it's quite brilliant. But oh, I just I just fell in love with that. I was hearing all the all the build up to that movie from podcasts I was listening at, at that time. There was a lot of fucking build up coming up to Grindhouse, and you know who was getting involved, and it was like really a big fucking thing. It's like Edgar Wright, he's going to do a thing, you know. Rob Zombie, he's going to do a bit, you know. And it really got pumped up, so I couldn't wait, and I fucking torrented it. And it's a video, it's a cam. Okay, so somebody just went into the theater, turned on a fucking camera. Yeah. I think it's better that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I totally do. I'm watching it, and you'll see some dude just stand up and go get some, go out some fucking popcorn or something. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You'll, you'll hear the, the audience, like, murmuring a little here and there. <laughs> Yeah, a straight version of that. Machete. What do you mean? You would. I think you would. Like, I don't think I've ever seen an actual DVD of Grindhouse or. uh, Okay. Well, they never. I've only ever saw the cam, but I like it. (laughs) They've never. They've never fully released the two movies together on DVD. They released them together as one movie, like it was released in theaters. They did that on Blu-ray. But on DVD, they've only ever released the two movies separately. They've yeah. never released them together as they were supposed to be seen, and that's a shame. But the Quinn Tarantino version that was released, I think I got a used copy on Blockbuster, which really dates the whole, which really dates the whole thing. But it, it it's got like about I'd say I would just guesstimate like about. A half hour, maybe more footage into the movie. Really? Yeah. Mm. Like there, well, there are scenes, there are whole scenes that just were not in any way shown in the original. That's like, okay, well now I can put this back in. Oh, like the uh, like the lap dance scene. Yeah, the lap dance scene the is in there. Yeah. yeah, the lap dance scene is in there, and I liked the lap dance scene because the the crazy babysitter twins are in the background during the lap dance scene. The crazy oh, yeah? babysitter twins from the other movie, the Robert Rodriguez movie. Apparently right. they're crazy enough to get fake IDs and then sneak into a bar. They they do conventions a lot. They yeah. show up to conventions. They're still milking that shit. <laughs> I also like the fact that during Thanksgiving... I was over at my my in-laws, and we were just watching TV. We were watching some movie station on cable, and they were playing just nonstop kids' movies. And so we watched uh, Monsters University and some other thing and some other thing. And then they played the movie Sky High, and I'd never seen that before. It's just some kids' movie. Yeah. And it it's about the son of a of a legendary superhero team and he gets sent to the superhero school where you either get chosen as oh. a a superhero or a sidekick. Was that Kurt and, Russell? Yeah, Kurt Russell's in it. Yeah. He's like the, the Superman type person. And then I was also impressed at the fact that a a, a young uh Mary Elizabeth Winstead is in it. She was Ramona in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Mm-hmm. And she's the cheerleader in the second half of the Quentin Tarantino movie from Grindhouse. So really, this movie is, is like the first time they've ever worked together. And I'm like, wait a second, that's Stuntman Mike, and that's the cheerleader. Holy crap. <laughs> they were in the 
this movie before they were in Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof. How awesome is that? Also, two members of Kids in the Hall are in that movie. Uh, Bruce Campbell's in that movie. It, it, it really was, like, surprising. So was that a Robert Rodriguez? Maybe it was. I don't know who did it. I I just Cause... happened to see it on TV, and I, I don't think it was Robert Rodriguez. Because I know that... Robert I don't think Rodriguez. it was Robert Rodriguez. I don't think it was Robert Rodriguez because it was a Disney movie. It was Disney Skyline. Yeah, yeah but Rod, Robert Rodriguez also does the Spy Kid kids movies. Yeah, but he never and, did anything for Disney. And their uncle is Danny Trejo. Yeah. And Robert right. Rodriguez says that even in the Spy Kids movie, that is Machete. Yeah. That's just machete with his family. <laughs> yeah, which is a, so just just a little bit creepy. <laughs> yeah. I liked I I think the reason why I didn't see the machete too is because I liked I liked the the first movie machete as kind of a game because yeah. he created the preview for machete without ever thinking that he'd do the movie. So he just came up with a bunch of scenes that he thought was interesting. So then right. when Robert Rodriguez said, okay, well, I'm going to make a movie, he made it a game like, okay, now I'm going to have to try and make this movie so that it actually has all of the scenes in the fake trailer that I already did. <laughs> so I saw yeah. Machete going, okay, so how's it going to work Cheech into this? How is Cheech going to have a bunch of guns? How is Machete going to be making out with two chicks in a pool? Okay, how is this going to happen? How is that going to happen? And he did it all, and I was really impressed. But then, like, the second Machete came out, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's not going to be as fun because it's not going to be like a game to me. Yeah. I have that but it's, got memorized. Its, own, it's got its own charm, and I, I, I see where Robert Rodriguez is going, and I like that. Yeah. Okay. He's doing three movies that is going to take you through the, the lifespan of a movie franchise. Yeah. Okay. Where the first movie is just really fucking good. You know? And the second movie is kind of on the stupid side. You know? And yeah. then the third one, if he, if he actually comes out with it, which I hope he does, the third one is going to be Machete in Space. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's we've seen other franchises go down this path. <laughs> yeah, I was I was quite impressed in that same vein with uh, Twenty One Jump Street. Yeah, did you ever uh, see any of those? I, I wasn't in love with it, um, but. There were twenty one twenty one appreciated. Twenty one Jump Street was a was a pretty good movie. Twenty one Jump Street is infinitely better because it's a sequel that's pretty much entirely about sequels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because oh, twenty one Jump awesome. Street got twenty one Jump Street got taken down, so now you'll be working next door at twenty two Jump Street. And now we have a bigger budget, so hey, let's let's <laughs> waste it on this and waste it on that and and hey, these people are back. Yeah, it's really tough and cheek on, on like, hey, maybe we should solve this crime differently. Maybe we should go a different route. And everyone keeps saying, no, just do the same thing you did the first time. That's what <laughs> everyone wants. Just do the same shit, and we can get this done. And we can all get a paycheck and go home. It's really cute. And then the end credit sequence is this big long montage that that shows you twenty three through forty Jump Street. <laughs> yeah, cool. And and you can see them getting tired. Like this time, you can go. You're going to space camp, whatever. Uh, culinary school, okay. Med school, whatever. <laughs> and then at one point, he gets replaced by another actor, and it's like, hey, does he does he seem different? No, he looks like he always did. <laughs> it's it's really cute. It's a it's a sequel about sequels, and I really really like it. Yeah. I was impressed with that. I I was 
was impressed in, with Johnny Depp quite yeah. a bit, you know, because Johnny Depp, it's kind of funny because I was just thinking about it and it was like, okay, if Johnny Depp did not do a cameo in that movie at all, he would have been a douchebag, okay? Mm -hmm. If he Stan lead it, everybody would have been perfectly happy, okay? But no, he did it and he went kind of like above and beyond the call of duty yeah. to do that movie. And fuck is Peter Deloise. I was like, I mean, I mean, when that end scene started going down, I was like thrust through a fucking time tunnel. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I was just like, this is fucking awesome. One like, of the things that argue. surprised me, <laughs> one of the things that surprised me about Johnny Depp's scene is that he's cussing in it, and I thought, I don't know when the last time was that I heard Johnny Depp cuss in a movie. Yeah. I, I honestly can't think either. of a time in which in which I've heard him say the F word or anything like that. I haven't seen him in so long, and I, I, I haven't much cared, because, like, I didn't really like the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. And then it's all been, like, Dark Shadows or Willy Wonka. You know, yeah. all that kind of, you know, it's just like shit I don't want to see him. I want to see him do something like uh, The Ninth Gate again, you know? Something yeah. he can really chew on as an actor. Yeah. You know? Or Ed Wood, my God, he was fucking brilliant in Ed Wood. Yeah, he was amazing in that. Yeah. So Nick of Time. I haven't seen Nick of Time in a really long time. Nick of Time, that one doesn't struck a bell. It. He did it immediately after Ed Wood, and it was really gimmicky because the movie all happens in real time. Uh-huh. And everyone's like, oh, well, this is a strange gimmick. And then, like, five or ten years after that, they did the, the show 24, and everyone freaked out and thought it was so wonderful and original. But the whole movie, Nick of Time, it all plays out, it, you know, Within a two-hour period, and there's a lot of looking at a clock, and it's it's kind of it's it's cute. The only reason I saw it was because Johnny Depp was in it, and so was one of the Baptists who gave him the money for Plan Nine. And I'm like, oh, he's he's the bad guy in this. Oh, he was just in Ed Wood. Well, I have to see this movie. <laughs> yeah, the two of them from Ed Wood again. I gotta see this film. It was it was cute. He was good. Yeah. At it. Kind of your typical. Oh, I'm a normal every guy who's suddenly thrust into this position. That sort of a thing. I can't think of me the last time I've seen him in something that I liked. It was probably it was probably a goddamn Lion's Gate. I liked. I. I would have really liked Dark Shadows if I had never seen Dark Shadows, the TV show before. Yeah. But it would always be playing on some UHF channel growing up and I was like, hey, what is this? Is, is it a soap opera? <laughs> is, is it a vampire soap opera? Is this, what in the world am I watching? Okay, I'll stay here and watch this for a while. I have no idea what's going on, but this seems pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they just turned it into a fun tongue in cheek romp sort of thing movie, and it's okay. Yeah. Alice Cooper's in it, and I like that. Because he plays. Well, I always like to see Alice. He plays a really good. He plays, uh, he plays one of my favorite songs of his. In the movie, he plays that, uh, that song he does, uh. Oh, what is it? It's a. I forgot the name of the song now. It's about the guy who played Renfield in Dracula. Ooh, I don't know that one. It's a really good song. It's it's. Ah, I'm I don't a lot remember, more but... familiar with his older shit. Yeah. He he's from Phoenix, and I I I've met oh, him the, once the, or the, twice. The, the, the battle of the 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 battle of the twice right. Yeah, that's it. That that's is it. some of his oldest shit. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and he plays himself, and uh, Barnabas keeps thinking that that he's a girl. Okay. And it's 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 kind of a cute little scene. He's there in like a Alice Cooper's there, and he's in like a, a straight jacket, and he's singing that song. And Barnabas is just looking at him. That is the ugliest woman that I have ever seen. Like, okay, <laughs> that's kind of cute. I like the song, and all right, whatever. I didn't watch it. Yeah, I rewatched the series um, a couple of years ago, and. I still like it, but it was bad. It's not. It, it, it's not a good show. <laughs> yeah. For something, I mean, I, I still like it. I like it a lot. It has a lot of camp value and things like that. But for a show that the world went nuts over, you know, yeah, a, almost in a Beatlemania kind of fucking way. Yeah, like lunchboxes. And T-shirts and like board games and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like oh, this is. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> and it's so weird. We we have a library here in the town that I live in. So I live in a small ass town in Oklahoma, and the library is horrible. And the the people who work there are all just middle-aged women who don't want to be interrupted from their busy work of occasionally putting away a book and primarily checking out their Facebook page. Yeah. And it's it's usually surrounded by a lot of homeless people or people who are on drugs and want to charge their phones. Okay. It's It's not the greatest library in the world, but for some reason... They have the entire Dark Shadows collection on DVD. Really? And, and, and every time I see it, I'm just really. I mean, you you you, you, you don't even, you don't have Gone with the Wind or any of the Godfather movies, but you have every Dark Shadows episode. How is this possible? It, it's really weird. It, it you should really give it a try, but definitely. Skip until <laughs> Barnabas shows up. You yeah. know? Because before that, it was just a bad soap opera. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It wasn't too terribly different than other soap operas. It, it, it was just boring and dull. So definitely well, go it, for, uh, you know, once Barnabas shows up. Well, in that same bad soap opera light, everyone my whole life has been telling me that I have to watch Doctor Who. Yeah. And and they always tell me, like, okay, no, start with the 11th Doctor. No, start with the 8th Doctor. No, start with the 10th Doctor. Well, the 4th Doctor is fun, but you really don't want to start until the 90s. And everybody always gives me, like, this different thing. And because I'm a completist, I always feel that I have to start from the beginning and work my way to the now. But apparently yeah. it's not possible fully possible with Doctor Who because it's been around for so long. When I was a kid, I vaguely remember, you know, it was always on TV. It was on PBS and I, I'd watch the, the fourth Doctor and I'd, I'd see his robot dog and I thought it was cute and weird aliens and I liked it, but I never paid attention to it. So right. I, I tried watching Doctor Who from the beginning on Netflix and they, they, they have like Classic Doctor Who, season one, episode one, but apparently what that is is the first episode that Netflix could get, and we're just going to call it season one, episode one. So Netflix are a bunch of liars. Is that what when that it comes is? To Doctor Who. Yeah, because okay. I started watching, I'm like, okay, I'll watch Doctor Who from the beginning, I'm going to watch this episode, and they're in Egypt. Okay, I have no idea who the fuck these people are. Apparently... Uh, a lot has happened before, yeah, okay, I'm completely lost. I tried to, to still watch it, but I didn't realize that those first Doctor Whos were really, like, live-action soap opera crap. And, like, and I, I saw the first one on Netflix, man. That was fucking hard to get through, and I don't think I got through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he was. He, oh, it was amazing. He, and also, I'm having a hard time with Doctor Who because, he, like the, like I was expecting. Okay, well, here's season one, episode one. Here's season one, episode two. But apparently, there are different doctors and then different plot lines. Yeah. Like different themes. It's like, okay, well, this plot line happens in the first four episodes, and then the the Daleks happen within the the three episodes after that, and then the eight episodes after that are an arc where they go here, and then five episodes where they go here, and then these two episodes, and then this is a standalone episode, and then this is, and it's just, it's so exhausting. (laughs) So I, I... I really want to try and watch everything. I just don't think it's possible. It's really I, frustrating. I could, see, I could see why you would feel that way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, Tom Baker was good. And yeah. And then I lost interest. You yeah. Know? Yeah, there was a period in time when just everybody at my work would just would not stop talking about Doctor Who and the new Doctor Who and this episode and this and that and I just like I feel like I need to hire a guide like I need a Doctor Who Sherpa to lead me through this because that's how, how massive and expansive this is yeah I I, I for there I would say just skip to the new ones you know better budget nicer production value better acting all that kind of stuff you know uh, and you would start with David Eccleson the first new Doctor or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It's just confusing to me. He's like the ninth or tenth or something. Aren't we supposed to be talking about a movie? <laughs> uh, yes. 1962's Carnival of Souls. Or, oh, okay. I, I have a better name for the movie. Okay. My my name my yeah, I think a better title for the film would be Never Go to Utah. Never go to Utah. So that's really the moral of the story. A, um, a, a church organist. And can we talk about this? Why aren't there more movies about church organists? Exactly. exactly. That could be a whole genre of film. Church organist horror noir. That's what this movie is. Uh huh. Uh-huh. You know, I, I can I can even see the scene in my head where there is the church organist and the priest comes out and he's just like, "You're here a little late tonight, aren't you?" <laughs> oh, <I> yes. <laughs> Yeah. There's one of the reasons. That one of the reasons. Line in the back. <laughs> one of the reasons why I wanted to see this movie was because it was featured in an inventory list on the Onion AV Club website. Have you been to the Onion AV Club? Uh, not in a really long time. Okay, I get most of my news from there. I absolutely love the Onion AV Club, and they have. Yeah. These inventory lists, which are really, really good, and there was one recently, and it was a list of 12 feature films from directors who never made another feature film. And I was That's looking good. through it. I was looking through it, and I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, I remember that film. Okay. And then I, I saw Carnival of Souls, and I thought, really? Because that was interesting to me, because I've seen so many late-night screenings of that movie it, it, that that happened throughout, and I've seen it so many times appearing on television. And they even released a, a Criterion Collection DVD of this damn movie. Yeah. So I was, I was in that, that a film that apparently is in such high regard amongst cult movie lovers that the person did one movie and never did another movie. But I, I've got a bombshell for you. I okay. did some detective work and I uncovered something. All right. Uh, I'm so excited to share this. 
I've been sharing it with people. I've been trying to, to tell people about it, but it's it, it's a weird one. You have to be a, a specific type of movie lover to appreciate this. So, um, okay. the film was directed by a man named Herc Harvey. It took him about three weeks to make it, and it cost about $33,000. He only made this one movie, but he did make over 400 educational films for various companies, including the Centron Corporation and Young American Film. And so I figured if he did over 400 educational films, then, you know, there has, there has to be some of them that still exist. And I found, right. I found one of them that is pretty famous. Oh, hey, he did, he did the short titled Cheating, which was featured on an episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh-huh, okay. It was specifically featured in the Wild World of Batwoman episode, and it's a... Oh, that was a, a tough episode. Yeah, it's it's like a 10 or 15 minute short film all about this kid, and he, he cheats on his friend's test, and... I, it's an episode that I specifically remember because later on when they moved into the actual movie, all of the cut scenes between Joel and Dan the Bot, they, they all still focus on the short. Because <laughs> Joel makes, Joel makes everyone write essays about the short cheating and Crow, uh, cheats on his essay. And so they have a trial, and I always thought that that was interesting. Wow, this is the one episode where there's a movie going on, but they're still just focused entirely on the tiny short. <laughs> and he did that short. He did the short cheating from the Street Science Theater. And I and that makes so much sense to me, because I always thought that that was one of the weirdest and scariest shorts they ever saw, because the, the, the little short film, Cheating, is very dark, and yeah. the kid is really haunted by his decision to cheat, and he's, <laughs> he's scared by it, and he has nightmares, and it, especially the first scene of the film, he's in just a completely darkened house waiting for the phone call that will decide his fate, and it's Ooh. so dark and moody and mysterious, and it's got beautiful lighting and strange camera angles. And so it really is sort of, I don't know if it was made before or after Carnival of Souls, but it definitely feels like it. And I'm so proud what? that I figured this out. Because that, that wasn't on Wikipedia or any website I went to. I, I figured that out. He did cheating. Um, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to find that episode now yeah. and rewatch cheating. Because the only thing I remember about that is how boring the wild wor- world of Batwoman was. Oh yeah, that's a horrible movie. That's an absolutely <laughs> horrible movie. So the actual short cheating, it sounds really familiar, but other than that, I I don't remember it. It's on. It's on a. It's on YouTube on its own. You can just search. MST3K yeah. cheating, and you can pop it up. But I'm so, so proud that I figured that out, that the director that, did cheating. That is pretty excellent. You're probably the first one. I mean, I've heard other people cover this show before, but I think you're the first one that brought that up. Yeah. You know, so that's... It, in my mind, because I like I like making connections between movies that aren't actually there, yeah. in my mind... The kid who cheats in cheating eventually moves on and becomes the drag racing guy in the beginning of the movie. <laughs> and so in that sense, cheating is really a prequel to Carnival of Souls. This movie really did not like guys, though, did it? No, it didn't. Because every guy was just such a swarmy bastard. <laughs> it's all the movie is, is all about this woman that's haunted by a grim white face man who was played by the director that's actually her Harvey himself but wow. what's worse what's worse than being haunted by a grim white face 
wise man. She's also haunted by a horny drunk guy who lives <laughs> across the hall. That's yeah. even worse. And and he, he used to just pop into her apartment and go, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> He's I'm gonna stare at you for a while. Huh? I'm gonna stare at you for a while. No, he was like a proto squiggy from Laverne and Shirley. Yeah. That's who that guy was. Yeah. yeah, especially with his white shirt. I like, works at a factory. Mm hmm. I, my, my nine year old daughter, she sat down and watched it with me because she's just itching to watch scary movies. Yeah. And I had never seen it before. So I wasn't expecting, like, some lecherous drunk guy to be yeah. appearing throughout the movie. But I, I told her, I said, hey, Bella, hey, I haven't seen this. I'm not sure what's happening, but you might not like it because it's not scary. It's just kind of spooky. Mm-hmm. But every time that guy's face would just pop up, that grim white face, man, she would scream. She would just she would freak out. But then when the movie well, was, was over, she was like, she was like, oh, so that's it? Wow, that wasn't scary. I mean, it was cool, but it wasn't scary, Dad. That was the one thing that that's really interesting about this movie is that when they wanted to get into creepy and get into really creepy, it was very creepy and very atmospheric. And I absolutely loved the makeup, and I loved the main creepy guy, even though he kind of looked like Grandpa Munster. Did you yeah, notice that? A little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very creepy, and then it was long periods of just bullshit. <laughs> yep. You know? Yeah. I, I heard somebody say about this movie once is that this movie would have made an awesome Twilight Zone episode. That's nice. You know, nice. if you just if you just killed everything except for the creepy bits. In 2011, Entertainment Weekly called Carnival of Soul maybe the greatest horror movie you've never seen. Yeah. But I think that's, that's pretty good. But this really isn't a horror movie. It, it's it's more atmospheric, and it, it's, mm-hmm. it's odd, and it's dark, and it's it's a beautiful movie, but it's not, it's not a horror film, really. No. No. It has everything that you would expect in a in a in a cult movie. I mean, it has the low budget. It it has a very amateur seeming cast. A lot of the secondary characters that you see here and there just really don't. They seem to be real people. Yeah. You know, it's when yeah. you see the people in the beginning trying to find. The, the car in the lake or to see if anyone survived. I, I can't imagine that there was a big casting call and people auditioning for that. It just looks like, you know, he just got some good old town folk. Mm-hmm. The setting was, you know, it, it seemed like it was set in a small town. I was confused at the beginning. I was confused at the beginning of the film. I found the opening unbelievable because oh, God. I, I can't imagine any period in time in which one person would just drive up to another person and say, hey, would you like to drag race? And then the other person says, yeah, sure. And then you just (laughs) go off and drag race. I imagine groups of like-minded people saying, hey, we should go drag race together, but I can't imagine, hey, stranger, why don't we drag race? They reminded me of a They reminded me of a story. The girls. Yeah, you know? yeah, because it's like, wait, the girls agree to go drag race? Then where the hell are they drag racing where they start off drag racing in the city? And then 20 <laughs> seconds later, they're going down an empty rural road. Yeah. Like, where <laughs> in the world are they that this is mm-hmm. happening? It's like, wait a second, you were downtown and now you're at the abandoned road. Mm-hmm. And... When we were watching it last night, Jeannie made a great observation, which was pretty funny. Um, 
because now the car goes off the bridge, uh-huh. and you have you, know, you have the cops, you have all the townspeople and stuff like that looking for the car, and she's like, "That pond is not that fucking big." No, it is not. Where's the car? It's there. <laughs> like, how can you not find it? If that's like a stream. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, the, it's surprising the bumper isn't sticking out. <laughs> yeah. The unbelievable drag racing reminded me of a story. When yeah. I was in eighth grade, I went to go and see a concert. And it was a sound garden opening up for Guns N' Roses. Okay. It was one of the, the best concerts I, I had ever gone to. It was uh, the Use Your Illusion Tour for Guns N' Roses. So they were really, really good right before they just collapsed, you know? Yeah. It was then at their peak and, and November rain and stuff like that. It was a really wonderful concert. And Soundgarden had just come out and uh, Outshine had just come out. It was a wonderful concert. And I was I was still in eighth grade at the time, so I, I didn't know too much about music, but I just knew that I liked Guns N' Roses, and if I was going to go to the concert, I needed a leather jacket. Mm-hmm. Because if, if I'm going to go to a rock and roll concert, then I will need a leather jacket so I can look tough. Okay. So I got a, a leather jacket, and I got some jeans, and I went to the concert with my friends, and we're all just big nerds, you know. But we go to the concert, and right in between Soundgarden and Guns N' Roses, I had the most pleasant experience, because some guy in his 30s come up to us, and they go, he wasn't wearing a shirt, and he said, hey, boys, how you doing? How are you boys doing? You having a good concert? And we're like, yeah, it's pretty good, and... and the guy, like, he might have been on something, I don't know, but he's the nicest guy, the nicest guy in the world, and he shook our hands, and, you know, we weren't robbed or anything, but he just said, uh, yeah, you guys look like you're having fun. Hey, uh, you guys want to fight? You guys want to fight? Any of you want to fight? Get into a fight? You guys want to fight? Because I'll fight you if you want. And, you know, we were in eighth grade, so we just went, uh, no. And then the guy just says, well, all right, then. I'll see you later. And he took off. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe that. We were just looking at each other and, well, that's nice of him. How how nice of him to ask us instead of just punching us in the goddamn face. <laughs> Thank God he didn't just start punching, you know, a, a 12-year-old. Cause that would have been disturbing, but... And then later on in the concert, during some, like, during some song, I don't remember what song, but during some song, there was a big scuffle, and yeah. uh, crowds were, were gathered, and we managed to see, we, we went over to see what, what had happened. Apparently, there was some big fight, and some people were being taken out of the concert, and one of the people that was being taken out by security was the guy who so <laughs> politely asked us if we wanted to fight. And I remember thinking, oh, good for him. He found a fight. And he saw us and tried to wave to us as he was being escorted out of the concert. (laughs) Just the nicest guy in the world, just politely asking. I would like to think that that when he finally got into his fight, he'd just go into people and say, hey, do you want to get into a fight? Well, absolutely, sir. All right, then. And then they start exchanging blows, you know. Mm-hmm. Like an 1890s boxer, you know. They got their fists going the wrong way. And they keep saying, boy. boy. That's, what the, that's what the drag racing reminded me of. You know, not drag racing in the sense of, hey, I have something to prove, man. And we're going to race. To see who wins the girl. No, just a, hey, would you like to drag race? <laughs> hey, you church going ladies. Would any of you like to drag race this fine afternoon? <laughs> like, okay, okay, I'd rather just fight. 
everything else in the film is believable. I, I believe that if I go to Utah, I will be chased by pale-faced white people. <laughs> but I can't imagine just such a polite drag racing scene. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> They would have to all be Mormons, too. I, there was a part of me, there was a part of me that, that felt that, and this is probably just me projecting, but I really did feel that this film could be, uh, a good film to explain PTSD to someone. Post traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Because I, I I have post-traumatic stress disorder because I was in a robbery. And a lot of this film felt like, okay, if I was going to explain to you how it feels to have post-traumatic stress disorder, I could either try and tell you for a really long time or just point at the girl who stars in the Carnival of Souls and say, okay, well, that. <laughs> like something bad happens to you. Like, say, in my case, you're in a robbery at work, or in this woman's case, she gets into a hideous car accident and her friends die. And then everything else that happens to her uh, is, is just pretty much how to feel. Like, okay, well, I'm over this, and I'm like, everything's fine now, and I'm going to go about my life, and is that someone behind me? That's pretty much post-traumatic stress disorder right there. I thought it was quite beautiful film that way. And and it, it, there was a there was a, a bizarre thing that happened because I I watched it with my daughter and so she leaves her small town in I'm assuming Kansas to go and live in Utah. And so she's driving by herself, right? And she's getting to Utah and it's dark and suddenly she sees the, the face of that grim white faced guy in the window and she freaks out and and then oh wait she looks again and oh it was just her reflection when that happened my daughter yelled well that's what you get for thinking you can go somewhere alone (laughs) and I paused the movie and I'm like Bella that was strangely sexist do we need to have a discussion or something and she she said, well, she's traveling by herself at night. She shouldn't do that. She's a lady. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, Bella, you and I will have to at some point in time about women <laughs> is odd considering you're a woman. But we're just going to keep watching the movie, okay? But just to let you know. Women can travel on their own now. They can also wear pants and not have to be married to a man. These are all things that women can do. They can work in factories. Oh, Father, you can be so amusing sometimes. (laughs) I just, I was surprised by by (laughs) my nine-year-old daughter's sexism. I really loved all of the scenes that centered around the remnants of the abandoned boardwalk, carnival, whatever that was. Yeah. It really yeah. seemed like, okay, well, she's going to find the Joker here. <laughs> not not the Heath Ledger Joker, who's like a serial killer, but my type of Joker, the one that's always hiding in the abandoned amusement park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the abandoned yeah. carnival. Apparently, fifty percent of Gotham City are is abandoned carnivals and theme parks. Because the Joker's only hiding in one, and it almost stands to reason. What else? What else is going on in Gotham? It's like either that or the ballet. Yeah, you know. Yeah, there's always some hoity-toity thing going on. Yeah. Which seems to be right next to the abandoned, uh, right next to the abandoned carnival. Hi, Maxwell. 
I love you too, baby. Hey. How am I in the van? Because I climbed up here. Hey, Maxwell, I got a question for you. Come here. What did you think about the scary movie we watched today, Carnival of Souls? What did you think about it? Tell me. Um, it was cute. It was cute. It was cute. So, Car- Carnival of Souls is a really cute movie to show three-year-old kids. <laughs> so that's good. That's good to know. Thank you, Maxwell, for that good review. Thank you. <laughs> Maxwell. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Well, that's Maxwell's review. Maxwell gives it one tiny thumb up. Okay. He thinks that well, Carnival of Souls is cute. That's really like the only review you need. Carnival of Souls is cute. <laughs> How awesome is that? It, it is cute in spots. There was a part in the movie that cracked me up, that that absolutely cracked me up, because in the movie, in the movie she goes shopping. Right. And it, I, I made a commercial for the place that she shopped. I made a commercial for the place. Would you like to hear my commercial? Yes, please. Okay. It goes like this. Are you a woman in the Utah area looking for ugly clothing? Then stop on down to the Black Dress Warehouse. We are Utah's leading supplier of black or dark gray dresses. Do you want to look like a housewife? Do you want to look like a woman who is suffering depression or is possibly mourning the loss of a of a loved one? Or perhaps you're a woman being haunted by the grim specter of death. If you are, then come on down to Black Dress Warehouse. We sell black dresses, and that's it. Off of Route 9 and Main Street, Black Dress Warehouse. I was having that run through my head as I was watching her in the, like, oh, wow, black dress. Oh, and another black dress. Oh, is this the church organist store? This is the church organist store. And and again, why aren't there more movies about church organists? This could be a whole this could be a whole subgenre of films. Tom Cruise stars as a ex CIA agent and church organist <laughs> who is framed for the killing of a parishioner and now has to run from things. You you cast Tom Cruise as the church church organ, organist? Yeah. And ex CIA agent. Who is framed for the murder of a fellow churchgoer. I and then has to, to run go. quickly from from the bad guys and also gay thoughts. I, I, I think I would have to go with uh Rose McGowan. Rose McGowan? Yeah. That's a good one. Because she's the church organist who, who was maybe haunted by her past. Yeah. I, I, I want to see her other leg. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. Rose McGowan. As the church organist. <laughs> and then Daniel Day-Lewis, in his starring role, he plays the organ. He plays Not the as organ? in he... Not as in he plays the instrument of the organ. No, he plays the actual organ. Well, he's really fucking good, so he could pull it off. That's how great of an actor he is. He would, you you know who else, you know who else, God rest his soul, would have given us a badass organ? Who? Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, yeah, he would have made a great organ. He would would have made a great organ. organ. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to mention, I wanted to mention, um, there's, there's this syndicated radio show that plays on Sunday nights called Delilah. Have you ever heard Delilah? 
I have not heard Delilah now. That's understandable. Her show is syndicated on whatever station it is that plays soft rock hits from the 80s, 90s, and today. And she's she's an old woman, and she plays sad soft rock music and also takes calls from people who are troubled and uh, reads letters where she tries to help people who are in distress, and she's Delilah, and she always talks like this in a calm, soothing voice to help her listeners. And I absolutely hate it, but also I can can never turn away because I just I just love watching train wrecks. I guess. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can totally see that. I can totally. So see I was that. driving late at night last Sunday, and I, I put on Delilah, and she she. Had she her she did a commercial and the commercial was this next hour of broadcasting is brought to you by the American Association of Realtors and then went on to talk about the American Association of Realtors. Now I'm going to talk about something else, but it's going to be 100% related to this. There's a video that I recently showed my kids and they became obsessed with it, and it's a like a, a little 15 second video clip of a documentary that is narrated by Benedict Cumberbatch. And it's a documentary about penguins, but he can't pronounce penguins. He either calls them penguins, P-E-N-G-W-I-N-G-S, penguins, or penglings, with an L, penglings. He just, he absolutely cannot pronounce the word penguins. And it's like a supercut of all the times that he says the word penguins. And every time he does, he says it wrong because he can't say it. And my kids were just cracking up. And my oldest daughter was getting red in the face because she was laughing so much at the fact that Benedict Cumberbatch can't say the word penguins. And now if you want to get her, now if you want to get her to laugh, you just, you just tell her, you just tell her like penguins, penglings, and she'll start cracking up, right? I now so want to see Doctor Strange fighting demonic penguins. Penguins. Yeah. How awesome would that be? So I almost got into an... You wouldn't be able to see the spell to expel them or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be a good Doctor Strange. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I really only ever seen him in Star Trek, and I I wasn't thrilled with him there. So I'm kind of hoping. No, nah, he's. That, you know, I, from everything I hear, he's a good actor. So like, you know, whatever. Um, but I was a really big Doctor Strange fan, you know. So mm-hmm. this one's mine, man. Don't hurt it. <laughs> yeah. But I almost got into a car accident this last Sunday. Oh, what happened? Because. Of- yeah, well, apparently Delilah can't pronounce the word realtors. Okay. Just like Benedict Cumberbatch can't pronounce the word penguin. So Delilah went, oh, she, she, she cannot pronounce realtors. So she kept saying, this next hour of broadcasting is brought to you by the American Association of Realtors. Okay. <laughs> If you need your house sold, go to an authorized Realtor. Only Realtors can get you. So I just pictured in my head a massive group of real estate agents slash Tor Johnson impersonators. Okay. Yeah. And they've got like that ripped up jacket from Plan Night from Outer Space, but it's like red, like like <laughs> like a real estate agent. And has a little plastic badge on it. Yeah. And I just I just couldn't couldn't stop picturing Time for go to open house. <laughs> Note sunk in living room. Like grab Thor's hammer. What a savings. <laughs> Tor think kitchen could be spruced up. <laughs> but, but real tours. 
if you want to sell your house, you need to contact a real tour, not a fake tour. Mm-hmm. Not like some sort of made-up tour, but a real tour. You got to find a real tour. Even even though the fake tours are gluten free, yes, you still want the real one. Yes, an absolute real tour. Why was she? Wait, I'm going back to Carnival of Souls. Why was she fired as the church organist? She was fired. He didn't like the music she was playing. I think. So, so he didn't like that she was playing out of tune circus music. He really did seem just so like, how dare you play that? But it wasn't like she was playing like Stairway to Heaven backwards or some sort of like satanic song. She was, you know, she was just playing. She was playing something weird, but. It's like the priest had a hard on for like okay the first the only rule for our new church church organist never play a non Jesus song mm-hmm. even if you even if you start playing chopsticks we'll have to kick you out mm-hmm. no it no just seemed how, like a no matter how uplifting it may be yeah no matter how uplifting <laughs> your version of chopstick might be. It just seemed like a pretty weak reason to fire someone. And he was pissed, well, too. He was you know, pissed. It is taking the glory away from God and stuff like that. And it's probably in the Bible. We would have Man. to be in books. That's, again, that's why there has to be more movies about church organists. I guess maybe I just don't understand. I guess maybe people should just make more church organist movies so I can understand their feelings, their plight, you know? And and, and also just become become aware of the subculture. Yeah. You know, that is, like, do they have conventions? You know, is there a hotel out there someplace that's hosting a bunch of Half drunk church organ players. Yeah, it's possible. I would think. You know, do they have like little? Isn't that what, isn't that what isn't that what Hotel Rwanda was about? Or am I thinking of is that something else? <laughs> I, I thought that was all mean, about a drunken church organist. It, it's it's very. It reminds me of that that Six Feet Under TV show that I watched for a while. I wonder if we could get some sort of an award for being the podcast to mention the word church organist more in one episode than any other podcast. We would have to find some research on that. That you know, we I would guess what we would have to do is we would have to just claim it. And then see if well, I, out of the woodwork to challenge. I think first I would check to make sure that there isn't a podcast solely for church organists. There's a good point. And as long as there's not a podcast specifically for a church organist, then I'm pretty sure that, that we would have the record for saying church organists more in a single podcast than any other podcast has said church organist. Mm-hmm. And I specifically tried to say church organist in that one sentence more so that we could just clinch that award. That award being the award for most time saying the word church organist in a single podcast. And I'm pretty sure that this very long run-on sentence that repeatedly mentions the phrase church organist is really going to cinch this for us. Uh, I, I think I think it might be just the just the whole conversation, uh, the whole delving into the amount of times a podcast may say church organist, um, and if there is a church organist award, and if we can win the church organist award, and is there a podcast for church organist? Church organist, yeah, um, yeah. 
is there possibly a church organization? Well, no, there are too many church organizations. But organists, okay? Yeah. And can we can we redefine it to make it really dirty, too? That's a good yeah. point. If there was a podcast specifically for church organists, do you know yeah. who would be, they would probably have a sponsor? And do you know who the sponsor would probably be? Who do you think? The Black Dress Warehouse. They're off of Route 9 on Main Street. Yes. Just down the road from the abandoned boardwalk carnival. I mean, if you need to get a black dress or a very, very dark gray dress and you're in the Salt Lake City area, there's no better place to go than the Black Dress Warehouse. (laughs) I'm just so now, saying, don't you think if you, if you spent enough on a church indulgence, you should get the church organist for free? Oh, man, indulgences. Those are awesome. Oh, I, 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 I do. I love indulgences. Yes. Man, what Catholics should that? really bring that back. Just kind of like a, just once, one month, have like a retro month. <laughs> hey, the Catholic Church is going retro this month. We're going to bring back the Inquisition. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> this week, buy an indulgence and persecute heretics. This this new Pope is kind of cool. He Have is kind of cool. Do you check him out from time to time? He is kind of cool. I, I saw him. Uh, he was wearing Converse. I think he wants to get shot. That's well, I made up the converse part, I just want to say. I just It seemed like something he would do because he's so cool. He, he would, it, would not be, it would not surprise me if he was wearing converse, um, eating Cheetos and laughing at Ren and Stimpy. He's, he's so cool, he wears his Pope hat to the side. That is, that is pretty awesome. That's how cool he is. He pops yeah. the collar on his papal robes. <laughs> that's how that's how cool he is. <laughs> he ties his sweater around his neck <laughs> and just wears it. That's how cool he is. Yeah, but I, I, I love his style just coming out with kind of like, yeah, you know what? All animals go to heaven. <laughs> and you know what? I... Good atheists. Go fuck all of you. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while the Pope will come out and he'll be like, now I know this is weird, but maybe not hate all gays. And then everyone's like, oh, what? The Pope has said that before. <laughs> and then he comes out like, like a month later and he goes, evolution. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, what? No father said that before. I do, think, I do think he actually said something about that. Huh. I'm almost positive. Yeah. He said that, he said, I, I, I think, like, something close to what he said was, like, evolution. There, there may be something to it. And then everybody was like, what? No one said that before. And they're all shocked. That's the first time. Oh, you know, man, I might have to watch Christmas Mass now to see if he just comes out with, like, a big fucking bullseye on his Pope outfit. I used to go to Christmas Mass back when I was a... I was such a good lapsed Catholic, you know? Yeah. I was such a good... Like all good Catholics, I was smoking and drinking and hating being a Catholic, which is really a, an important part of Catholicism. The last time that I went to a Christmas Mass, um, I was working and... And I just talked to a friend of mine, and we were at the bar, and we we're like, "Hey, what are you doing for Christmas?" And he's like, "I don't know, but 
there's a part of me that kind of wants to go to church. And I'm like, dude, we should totally get drunk and go to my church. I haven't been there in like five years. So we got <laughs> drunk in the parking lot. And then we went into church. It was midnight mass, but I didn't realize that midnight mass apparently starts at 1130. Okay. And then gets out around 1230. So we're drunk, and we walk in, and everyone had just, like, gone on their knees to pray silently, and we just barge in there. It wasn't the best. Yeah. I might be going now, to hell for that. Now, if you came in screaming, hey, where's the hookers and blow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now I, that that might have cinched it. <laughs> have you ever seen the movie? Um, not only are you going uh, to hell, but you're going to hell now. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Bunny Lake is Missing? Oh, no. Hope always wanted me to watch that movie. I never got around to it, though. Yeah, a bunch of people have told me to get around to... A bunch of people have told me to get around to watching it, too, and I never have. It's just uh, one of one of our very strange TV stations here in Oklahoma has been playing nothing but B-movies all day. They've been playing some really good stuff. Earlier today, I saw that movie Berserk... Or is it Berserker with Joan Collins back when she was doing B movies, like in the like in the sixties when she was doing stuff like Trog and like really horrible films. You you yeah you're talking Joan Crawford yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah when Joan she Collins. was in like her her really weird bad B movie phase. And they yeah. played some. They played a oh oh they played the 4D Man. The 4D Man is a good movie. Yeah. Yeah, they, they've been playing some really good ones today, and I'm like, ooh, what are, they, what are you showing now? And they dust off some old, old thing. It's really wonderful. <laughs> I love my I love my weird Oklahoma TV station. And those are all local stations? Uh, yeah. I, I I guess apparently now uh, one of the the station that's showing B movies is currently showing the film Dead Heat on a Merry Go Round. I can honestly say that I have never heard of this film. That's the whole title, not just Dead Heat. The Treat Williams. No, nope, Dead Heat on a Merry Go Round. I like okay. to think that the whole film is a car chase, but on a merry-go-round. <laughs> Wait, I think I've gotten closer to the perp. Oh, no. No, he's still four horses in front of me. <laughs> I'm getting dizzy. Why does this weird organ music keep playing? And Maybe where? I should just shoot him. No, no, then I would hurt the fake horses on this where merry-go-round. Organist. Kind of like a, kind of like a, like a, like the movie Speed, but on a merry-go-round. Yeah. I might have to make this happen now. The more I think about it, the so, greater of an idea this is. So the horse would have to stay at 20 revolutions per minute. Yes, well, that's what I'm thinking. Or explodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty much my my entire pitch right there. I can get down with that. I can get down with that. Uh, yeah, we, and maybe we one of the backers. Yeah, maybe one of the 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 actors can be like like a former church organist. <laughs> They're just to get that to work. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, to take advantage of that big church organist demographic. <laughs> because that's that's the the demographic church organist that that really goes to movies nowadays. I I think church organists are our future. 
they cut out the whole scene in the beginning of Guardians of the Galaxy where you see that uh, Chris Pratt's Star Lord's mom got cancer while being a church organist. Yes. The, all the, the whole church organist backstory was just taken out, and I'm still upset about that. It, it was a shame, but you did have to make some cuts somewhere, you know. Yeah. Uh, like they say, you know, some of the best stuff winds up on the cutting room floor, you know. So yeah. it's, it's always sad, sad, but sometimes necessary. Yeah. And I believe the original plans for the soundtrack, was it was just going to be all church organist music. That would have been so breakthrough. It would have been. You know? It would have been different. Yeah, somebody took been... their eye off of Oscar to, to scratch that idea. Yeah. Just an all-church organist soundtrack. <laughs> and maybe, like, the old movies have, like, an organist there to be playing the music live. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Maybe show it at churches so you can get actual church organists to play church organist music. Yeah. During Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, I, I, I could see it though. You know, I could totally see it. Yeah, you know? that'd be good. Maybe like a director's cut. I'll hope for a director's cut that family really brings you back the church. Yeah, yeah, family could do a cameo as like a priest. Yeah, you know. I was upset that Stanley was Stanley. Stanley hasn't been in everything, because there have been some non-Marvel movies that I haven't seen him in. I'm trying to think. Like, I'm, what, I'm not sure if he was in the last... I'm not sure if he's been in all of the 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 new X-Men's, or if he's been in all of the Spider-Man's. Like, I'll have to go back and see. I'm not sure if he was in the last... X-Men movie, Days of Future Past. I haven't seen that one yet, but, you know, now that you mention it, I don't think I remember seeing him in, uh, what was the one just before that first class? Yeah. I don't know if he was in that either. I wonder if it's kind of a spite thing since Marvel broke off. You know, I don't know. Disney. You know, or it's like, well, you won't let us have our characters back? You don't get stand. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, there's a new Fantastic Four movie that's going to be coming out, isn't there? Oh, that's going to be a train wreck. It's supposed to, and it's it's probably going to be a train wreck because it's, it's the Roger Corman thing again. They're going to make another Fantastic Four movie so that they can hold on to the property. Yeah. Except this one is actually going to be released in theaters as opposed to that amazing Roger Corman film. I love that movie. (laughs) Roger Corman's Fantastic Four, which was created just to keep that copyright, is probably closer to the comic book than any of the other Fantastic Four movies. That's what I thought. I was like, Doctor Doom looks like Doctor Doom. Look at him, man. That's not to do. What what did they do with the other dude? Like, Mr. <laughs> Corman, I know that you created this just so that you could hold on to the rights, but you really did do a good job of making a Fantastic Four comic book into this movie because Jessica Alba should never play a blonde-haired, blue-eyed white woman. That was her most challenging role. <laughs> To play a blonde-haired, blue-eyed white woman. That's right up there with uh, Charlton Heston playing a Mexican. Yeah. Not if she's going to be keeping her clothes on, you know. Yes. Because yes. really. You know, not for nothing, but you have one set of talents. Yeah. That's what you need to do. I bet she would be good playing the church organ. She would probably be a good church organist. I'm thinking about that way too hard. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. 
Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put that in the back. I'm going to save that in the wank bank, okay? And at this sometime, I will need that in the future. Okay. And it will be Jessica Alba, church organist. Nice. That sounds like a very strange spinoff of Paul Blart Mall Cop. <laughs> Jessica Alba, church organist. <laughs> That's a good idea too. Mm-hmm. I will also need to get that done. In a in a room I, that has not. I think right. that I will have to wrap this up. I'm getting All the wrap right, up dude. signal. Oh, okay, is that what that was? That was your phone beep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. dude. So next week we will try special bulletin. A documentary style nuclear accident movie. I think I've got a, a I've already described. I've already got a really good story that I don't think I've ever blogged about, but I've I've got a really good story on on deck for that. Oh Excellent. I have I've got something to share before we finish. I have homework for our listeners. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um I'm always I'm always looking out for old and strange things to to try and get my young son hooked on. And at uh, a video store I got a box set of the original TV show, Japanese TV show Ultraman for like $5. It's the entire first season of Ultraman. And it's by the same people who did Godzilla. And there's even one episode where they literally just get the Godzilla costume and paint him a different color and put like like wings on him or something. It's really low budget and cheesy and stupid and for kids and just mind-numbingly bizarre. But there's a specific episode. There's one specific episode of Ultraman, which is literally the weirdest 20, 25 minutes that you will ever see. And it's yeah. amazing, and it's confusing, and it's bizarre. It is funny, and I honestly literally believe that everyone in the world should be forced to watch this one episode. It is free on Hulu, and it is free on Daily Motion. It's an Ultraman episode which is titled The Ruffian from Outer Space. The Ruffian from Outer Space. That does sound... The, that the does Ruffian sound like from Outer fun. Space. It concerns a meteor, and that's all I'm going to say. The rest <laughs> will will may very well melt your brain. So that is the homework? Yes. That is your homework for the week, listeners. The Ruffian from Outer Space. Watch it. It's only about 22, 24 minutes. It is the strangest 22 to 24 minutes you will ever see in your life, and you will be a better person for it. It will change (laughs) your viewpoint on life. Or it will make you want to kill yourself. But everyone needs to see this episode. That that is a pretty bold claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is well. This is an amazing episode. It it <laughs> it, it will blow your socks off. Oh man, there's so much about this episode that I want to talk about. But that's 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 my homework. I'm giving everyone homework. Everybody watch that 22 minute episode, and then next week I, we're gonna talk about it. Okay. Okay. So it's amazing. <laughs> just Google the ruffian from outer space and it'll pop up. Really simple. So we should go ahead and wrap this up for this week. Yes. Uh like us on Facebook, search for Pope on Film. Write us at Pope at Undeadcow dot com. Join us on Twitter at Pope on mm-hmm. Film. Uh mm-hmm. YouTube, you can find us there. And... And... 
And? And don't forget our Stitcher. I said Stitcher. Yo, you did say Stitcher? Oh, I missed the Stitcher. <laughs> oh, that's my favorite part, is when we talk about our Stitcher. Yeah, uh, yeah, one day we'll, we'll um, I'll look at it again and find out what the hell it's for. <laughs> it's, it's for, it's for stitching. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Facebook for surgeons. That, that very well may be a possibility. That's one of the, that's such a great idea. A Facebook just for surgeons and it's Stitcher. Boom. Stitcher for surgeons. That, that, that may be just a very excellent idea. Yeah. <laughs> so until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve. <laughs> We'll see you next week, you godless sodomites. Godless sodomites. We should make that a secret word. We should make that a secret word. We should make that a contest. You know, whatever you say at the end of the show, the first person to post that on our page, on our Facebook page, wins a prize of some sort. That's awesome. So somebody would just show up and, and just post Godless sodomites. <laughs> yeah, and then and then they win our respect. They they win our respect, and then people who are new to the page, they'll just be looking at the page, and it'll be like godless <laughs> sodomites, infidels, heathens. <laughs> what's, what's going on? <laughs> That's a great idea. It's a really great idea. They would, have, they would have no context. Yeah, none at all. So, hey, let's go for it. If anybody wants our, our love and our respect, please go to our Facebook page and be the first to post the secret words or secret phrase, Godless Sodomite. Godless Sodomite. And you will win our undying love and respect. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I got to go. Yes, we will me talk too. Next week. Yes, see you next week. Godless sodomites.